Go. Okay, Brian asked me to do something. It was, it was that vague of a mandate, having to do with religion or something. I think it was with you when I was <laughs> And there was some talk about me doing something about Islam, which, you know, I do in Civ a lot, but I'm mortally afraid of the Saudis, and I would say the wrong thing and be denounced. So I was like, let me do something that I know more about than uh, more about than that. And so I thought I would do what I think is an interesting slash somewhat unfortunate phenomenon. This tendency you see over and over in history for groups of people to sort of, you know, small groups of people create what I feel like are secular religions. I mean, essentially they're either blatantly replacements for religion or they're filling that same sort of function. I'll, I'll talk about what I mean in a moment. Um, and the things that come to mind first are nationalism, which is something that I think we think we know about, but we don't actually talk about it that critically in this country, unlike other places. Communism, which I know you've heard is bad, but again, I, I, I think it's been, you know, certainly for anybody born after, you know, the late 80s, it's just, it might as well be Atlantis. It's sort of far away, and we sort of lost our memory of what that was like. Um, I'm also going to talk about national socialism, which when I say it that way, you're, I'm sure most of you are saying, what the hell is that? I'm referring to Nazism, that's what that is. Uh, and yeah, yeah. It's, I, I make no assumptions. I mean, I have to understand. I have students. I mean, it's not their fault. Some of them were six when 9/11 happened, and that's just they, they just you know they have a very different consciousness than. I got a lot of Reagan and Red Dawn in the 80s. So, um, and when I say post-religious age, what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of historians writing, particularly say back in the 80s or the 70s sort of felt like, you know, in the Middle Ages, maybe the Reformation, the dominant way people thought was religion, but supposedly anyway, beginning particularly in the sort of late 18th into the 19th century, it's replaced with these other ideas. What I'm gonna argue is that's sort of true, but ultimately, I mean, as you're gonna see, nearly every one of these ideologies came into really, really bitter conflict with actual religions. And, um, you know, they, in many ways, sort of fulfilled the same function. And then just, I'll explain what I mean by that right now. So what I'm saying, when I, when I talk about secular religions, I'm basically referring to things that are basically ideologies that behave like religion. So I've asked you, like, what is a religion, what does it do? I'll throw this out to you guys. What is a religion? I'm sure a lot of you are religious or are anti-religious, but maybe don't necessarily give this a lot of thought. What's a religion? It's got a core set of beliefs, absolutely. It's a defensive core set of beliefs uh, set up to try and control the minds and pocketbooks. <laughs> I'm going to rephrase that to be a little more delicate. <laughs> These are ideologies that are definitely meant to reward certain outcomes and penalize others. I mean, you know, these are ideologies, all of them, that did have very much a sort of a controlling aspect to them. They would argue this was for the collective good. I mean, inherently by defining something as a collective good, there's something called the collective will, allegedly. But yeah, no, they're all, they can be incredibly controlling. And you'll see that in, all, in every one of these cases, certainly. And the supernatural element. They do, or if, if nothing else, I would say a cosmology. So an argument about what the world is now and what it's supposed to turn into and sort of a moral code that isn't necessarily based on fact, but based on belief, certainly. What else do religions have? Things like this. Yeah, rituals. Oh, ritual, so that absolutely. Part of the cosmology, some sort of origin and yep. utopia. And, yeah. Certainly, an origin story, ritual, all kinds of things that you're supposed to do to be part of that group. Um, authority figures and hierarchies, absolutely, yep. of course. They certainly have that. Um, yeah, well, and every or symbols, that's another thing. All of them usually put a lot of weight on, you know, whether it's the crucifix or the flag of France, in the case we're going to be talking about in a moment. You know, all of these elements, I think they are part of what makes up a religion. But as I go through any one of these, they have every one of these elements. And not, not coincidentally, as, as I'm going to argue. So I'm going to first talk about nationalism, this whole idea that I think us seems normal. We love America because it's awesome. I mean, I think that's about the extent of what we think about when we think about nationalism. <laughs> but you know, it's this idea. It is, as one historian called it, an imagined community where you, as a French person in Marseille or in Lyon, are literally imagining that you somehow have more in common with another French person on the other side of the country than you do with, say, an Italian who's only actually a few miles away over the border, say, if you're in Nice. Uh, and I'm going to talk particularly about, about La France, about France, because for better or for worse, it is the paradigmatic case that goes off like a supernova. And 
Right, essentially, as you'll see, nearly every one of these other nationalisms is either a derivative of French nationalism or a response to it. And usually it's an awkward mix of the two. We love this, but mm, we wish it wasn't you doing it, as we'll talk about in a moment. We're going to talk about Italy, who's a very good case of a country very profoundly influenced by the French national idea, but that felt super awkward about it. And uh, I'll be talking a lot about somebody named Mazzini, who I'm sure you've never heard of, but I mean, he literally tried to create the idea of Italy and the Italian nation as a religion that he said was going to replace Catholicism, which was the old thing that had made people do what needs to be done now was going to be this idea of Italy. I'm going to talk about National Socialism, uh, which, you know, basically usually is referred to as Nazism. And I know this confuses undergrads. Well, it's communism then, right? Well, no, not actually. I mean, it was sort of a, a very, very with hindsight, dangerous mixture of nationalism and then the idea of a collective. The, the collective they were talking about was not defined by where you were born, per se, or by some sort of civic identity. It was defined by race. Uh, we're going to be talking about communism, especially the Soviet variant. Again, for better or for worse, that's where the outbreak happens first. And what happens in Russia sort of becomes a model that, you know, we could have the same conversation about China or North Korea in terms of them treating these things like a religion. And I am going to briefly and probably awkwardly talk about the United States, which, you know, I, I think we look at this list and like, oh, pff, we're not like any of these people. Oh, oh. we're so I'm glad you're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, what I'm going to say is that there are certain things that we believe, I would say, rather uncritically in the matter of a religion, which, you know, there's a whole school of thought that says it's not a bad thing. I mean, that's sort of the neocon argument that you need myths like this to sort of motivate your behavior or we'd all run amok in a Hobbesian sort of way. So, now, why, why do humans keep creating things like this? And I feel part of it is, you know, I don't, I'm not a scientist. I think the data on this is, is a little, you know, is very preliminary, but there does seem to be some genetic component in terms of us and religion. Now, some people, I think, interpret that as some sort of God gene. I'm not going to go that far, but we certainly have a very deeply ingrained need to basically belong to something greater. Uh, and I think at least as important and more provable is the fact that, again, I'm always very wary of genetic arguments. But what I will say with a lot of confidence is that since humans have been humans and put together these beehive things we call society and stack rocks until you get pyramids, as long as that has gone on, we have been very, very thoroughly socialized to want to be part of sort of things larger than ourselves. Usually that was religion for most of human history. Um, as you're going to see, in sort of the 19th to 20th centuries, it becomes these other new ideas that are supposed to be even shinier, but well, they create problems. I think a lot of this is direct borrowing or imitation. You're going to see later a beautiful image from the Russian Revolution that shows how carefully they were looking at Orthodox Christianity and trying to take its symbols over. I mean, this was a very conscious choice. I think some of it is the fact that in many cases they were openly trying to displace an existing religion. So I think often they had to take on those characteristics and offer the same things. You'll see this from the very beginning with France, when they create the cult of the supreme being, they come up with this whole sort of atheistic state religion that makes peasants sad. That's what I'm going to say. Uh, and I think part of this is also convergent evolution, insofar as the framers of Italian nationalism or the creators of the national socialism had, if you want to be cynical, some of the same goals in terms of, let's just say, motivating people to do things in large groups. That's what I'm going to say. It's the best and worst thing of things about us. So let's talk about France, which I know most Americans view France as sort of cheese-eating surrender monkeys. Like, that's sort of our view of them. Uh, we had an unfortunate <laughs> blow up in class when somebody implied this. The problem with France is not that they either don't like fighting or are not good at it. The problem is that they liked it all too much and did quite a lot of it. Uh, and for a while, I mean, in a way that's hard for us to grasp because we sort of, I think, are very alienated from them. I mean, they totally dominate European cultural and social life for the better part of like 250 years until they stop having babies, and then the Germans. Anyway, the idea of France itself is quite old compared to some other places. I mean, it ain't China in terms of continuity of civilization, but it's certainly a much older construction than Italy or Germany. I mean, those only date from the mid-19th century. France, you know, they had a powerful monarchy back in the Middle Ages, and they had all kinds of national symbols, like who is this person here? Complete badass that the French ultimately betray and hand over to the English. Uh, Joan of Arc. Yes, so, <laughs> You know, the French were certainly aware when English people were invading that they were French. That was very clear to them. And, 
you know, ultimately, because the monarchy had this giant territory that they wanted to tax efficiently, and they wanted these people to not do things like help the English invade, originally, the idea of the French nation, to some degree, is coming from above. It's like the monarchy itself trying to sort of say, hey, we have a lot in common, by which I mean pay your damn taxes, and when I draft <laughs> you, you better like it. Well, I mean, we're talking about Louis XIV. He was not a nice man. But I mean, this idea of France as a collectivity originally comes from the monarchy, which is ironic given this happens to them. And, you know, this idea very quickly, they lose control of it. You know, the idea of the French nation begins as a sort of monarchical idea, but in the 18th century, you have a bunch of people called philosophes. I'm sure you learned about it one time and forgotten about Montesquieu, Voltaire, all these sort of people that imagined there was this thing called France. And there were people that should be its leaders, and there was some sort of collective will. Again, it seems normal to us to think of, you know, my country right or wrong, rally behind the flag. These were kind of new ideas. And ultimately, they lead to the monarch losing his head. I mean, things, let's just say things get a little out of hand. And it's really the revolution that, first of all, I think really crystallizes the idea of France as France. Because like it or not, everybody was participating, and many of them did not like it, but it, it turned into sort of this hurricane that sort of sucked everyone into it. And then because of Napoleon, it gets, it goes on a tour, let's say, for the rest of Europe, and provokes either sort of admiration and some imitation, but also total horror. Because a lot of, I mean, you know, the Germans and the Italians eventually realized that the French, yeah, they came to bring us liberty, but they're attacking us to death, and they have the sound of shooting us, so. So, oh, the French Revolution, this is the Bastille getting stormed. You know, and the, the elite in France, particularly once the Jacobins take over, really try to essentially wield, sort of weld the nation into a giant battering ram. This is the famous Levee en masse. This is where the Jacobins announced in 1793 that every man, woman, child, turtle, tree, rock, clot of dirt in France was now going to be turned into a weapon to destroy France's enemies. This was not optional, though, I want to throw this out there. I mean, while it's certainly appealing to people's sort of collective sense of Frenchness, it was the draft. Uh, and, you know, one of the things that the Jacobins tried to do was replace Catholicism, which for various reasons proved very, very hostile to the revolution, uh, with the cult of the supreme being, l'Estre Supreme, uh, which was literally a creation by the state of a sort of atheistic religion where you worshipped France and worshipped reason, almost like a deity which I think to Americans sounds kind of insane, but it was worth a try. I mean, ultimately, they were, they were in a situation where they needed to rally the French population. The church and the regime were, were terrible enemies, so they tried to do things like the festival of the supreme being. Like, they make their own holidays, their own calendar, their own deities. I mean, literally, they sit down in a committee meeting. All right, we need to make up a religion that's like Catholicism, but better, and that can do these other things we want, um, this doesn't go so well. I mean, this is one of the problems. It often takes a very long time for people to accept an idea like this. And let's say Catholicism had been in France by this point for over a thousand years. Um, they, you know, the French Revolution produced a lot of martyrs. I'm sure you know this painting, this is Marat. You know, this idea of a sort of revolutionary sacrifice, uh, giving for the cause. And indeed, the French Revolution had a very bad habit of eating the people that were creating it, sort of one after another. Uh, now, this attempt to sort of create a coherent France provokes a very ugly reaction in this part of France. It's called the Vendée. It's in the Loire Valley, where essentially priests and some nobles get a bunch of peasants together and form this giant mob that starts attacking revolutionaries and looks like it's going to march on Paris. Uh, and the French respond in the way that I think is much more reminiscent of a crusade than a normal military operation, because basically, even after they force the rebels, like they scatter the rebel army, but they make the decision that these people have collectively rejected France, they've rejected civilization, they are permanently enemies of the state, and they decide to make an example of the province by turning into a desert to prevent anybody in France from doing the same thing. At one point, they're packing peasants in boats and sinking them in the Loire to save ammunition. And, you know, this sort of, I mean, it was, you know, their reaction is essentially religious zealotry and the desire to destroy these people and basically cleanse them from France, and they do that. I mean, this kills thousands of people. And then this man shows up. So briefly, the revolution calms down a little bit, says, hmm, maybe we don't want the cult of supreme being or to keep executing our own leaders. 
But then this man busts through the wall like a Kool-Aid pitcher screaming, oh yeah. And, you know, first takes over France and then takes over Germany and then it just goes and goes and goes and goes. And everywhere he goes, he smashes reaction, imposes the Napoleonic civil code, hands France a flag, here you go, like makes new countries, gets where the Holy Roman Empire, just duct tapes some of it together. I mean, basically totally remakes France and gives it away to all his relatives. Um, we were in Tuscany, we saw his sister's apartment with pictures of him naked on the ceiling. It was a bit much. Yeah, another brother got to be king of Spain, another one got to be brother, another brother's king of Italy. So it was like a giant sort of, here you go, here you go, here you go. Um, this is them marching through Brandenburg Gate. Shortly after this, they pull that down and drag it back to France, making the Germans bitter for the rest of time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, people get upset. Again, you know, on the one hand, there are a lot of people who are initially very excited to see the French. And they admit that, you know, this old idea of organizing society based on God or based on the sovereign is manifestly inferior to this nation in arms. The problem is, you know, war doesn't end. The French, whatever progressive things they're trying to do, like emancipate Jews or end feudalism, end up provoking all sorts of reactions either from peasants. This is a very famous image in Spain where this is where the word guerrilla comes from, where they end up having to mow down a bunch of people to try and maintain control. There are actually two of those. There's a, there's a whole series of these. I don't doubt that. And there's, he did a whole, a whole series of these. There's, yeah. They're all super disturbing. These are all from Goya, who lived through the Napoleonic occupation, and it did not do good things to him mentally. And then the rest of Europe, you know, again, I'll talk about Italy in a second. Italy, on the one hand, literally adopts the French model, but also is sort of horrified and doesn't want to be French. I mean, their flag is a French flag with a new color injected into it. That's literally Napoleon says, here you go. That's where the Italian flag comes from. So, um, but you know, the French example, this just keeps happening. I mean, it's the thing. Once you have this sort of French national idea, it becomes something that people fight over. And France has another revolution in 1830, a failed revolution that gave us an important musical in 1832, <laughs> uh, revolution in 1848, revolution in 1871, another republic in 1958, another revolution in 68, I mean, just over and over and over. But you know, the idea of France makes them do insanely heroic, stupid things. Like during the First World War, which I'll say more about in a second, which was a in many ways more like a sort of a jihadist crusade to the death than a war as was understood prior to this. You know, I mean, the French decide that Verdun is a sacred symbol of French strength. They're willing to lose half a million men holding on to it, even though tactically it's stupid. There's a whole book about this, how just the French are so obsessed with this idea of the nation, their leaders are so committed to this idea of not yielding a single inch to the perfidious Germans that they just waste hundreds of thousands of themselves. Um, France today remains a country that is the most French thing in the history of France. I mean, France even today, I think this is why Americans can't quite interface with them. They're the only people, I think, who have pretensions as universalistic as we do. And we can talk about this if you're curious about it. I mean, essentially, the French, like the Americans, feel like they have come up with the one model for the entire human race. Which the Russians used to argue that, and then, you know. The wheels fell off the bus, they went bankrupt. Um, but now, with the only two societies left that still argue this way are the French, who, I mean, if you've been to France, they're very convinced of their own amazingness. That's what I'm going to say. But, um, you know, they've really bought into more than almost anyone else this idea of the French nation as this thing that's greater than some of its parts. So, Italy. <sighs> this one doesn't go so well. I mean, Italy, here you have actually the first Italians fighting together as Italians for France. But the first time they actually get to sort of coherently do something together is in the Napoleonic army. Don't worry, Napoleon is willing to waste literally hundreds of thousands of these people fighting his wars. Like a ton of them march with him into Russia. But they do get this amazing flag. They do get an administrative structure that for better or for worse, they hold on to. And, you know, the part of Italy that unifies the rest of Italy, Savoie, Piedmont, is precisely the part of Italy that was the least Italian. In fact, it spoke French, not Italian. And I want to point out that in Italy at the time of unification, something like 3% of Italians spoke Italian, which becomes a problem. Um, and about another 20% could sort of understand it, like if they were at an opera, but they didn't actually use it. Um, you know, Italy, I think Italy is a country who, unlike France, who sort of came of age at the right time and got everyone else in a headlock and did whatever it wanted, Italy peaked in middle school. Like they had this incredibly precocious 
flowering of capitalism and of state building and all these amazing things in the Middle Ages. I mean, back in the Middle Ages, the Italian states like Venice or Genoa or, or especially, of course, Florence were incredibly wealthy. They were, in terms of their economies, probably the most sophisticated places in the world, other than China and parts of the Middle East. Um, but the problem is, they didn't think of themselves as Italians. Why would they? They thought of themselves as Florentines, Siennans, and still do, by the way. Like, whether it's soccer rivalry, or just anywhere you go in Italy, they're like, why would you go to Siena? Those people are assholes. Like, that's one city away, and that's just, they have this mentality. So Italy, in some ways, peaks back in middle school, and then they give us, of course, the Renaissance. Amazing. Notice how small his stick is and how big his hand is. Yeah. <laughs> He's got a huge club, though. So it's, I think there's some compensation going on there. It's like a, sort of driving a Hummer. And he's like 10 feet tall. <laughs> to be fair, he is a young, I mean, it's David. He was like, what, 10 when he killed? I don't, I don't know. We, this is a 10-year-old. This is a clearly an anatomically correct 10-year-old. Well, I mean, the whole thing is supposed to show you the strength of Florence, which is ready to club you to death at any moment. Um, but, you know, the Renaissance is great and all, but... The problem is Italy doesn't unify, it's super divided, the Spanish get some bits, the Austrians up in the north, and that's the situation where our friends, the French, show up. You know, Italy had been divided by this point for centuries. You know, the French invade, not once but twice, because they get booted out briefly in 1799 and Napoleon, control, delete, control, delete, just comes back and does it again. <laughs> and they get extremely Frenched. That's a verb I just made up. So they get carved into bits, some of which Napoleon modestly adds to France, like Venice. Like, I think that would be really great if it were French, despite it being over there. Um, but for better or for worse, this is the first time that the two halves of Italy are anything even like a single state. There's like a thing in the north called the Kingdom of Italy, ruled by his brother. And another south, the Kingdom of Naples, ruled by one of his toadies. But nonetheless, for the first time, Italians get to, you know, raise armies that can sort of help fight for the glory of allegedly Italy, though more for France. Um, as I said, the Code Napoleon and French administration is imposed on, on Italy. And this is, you know, it's a huge sort of transfer of French ideas to sort of Italian intellectuals. Eventually, the French go away, not because the Italians can get rid of them, but Napoleon sort of falls down the stairs, gets up, falls down the stairs again, and then is safely put away. Uh, and so for a while, Italy sort of gets broken back up into bits, but you have this generation of people who get in their head that essentially, like all of history from the Renaissance onward is a giant humiliation of Italy. You know, foreigners are allowed to prey on it. Like we used to be freaking Rome, like in terms of just this, you know, we give the world the Renaissance and here we are, you know, basically being ruled by outsiders. And particularly this man, Mazzini, you've probably never heard of, but in Italy, he's part of this sort of holy quadrumvirate of people who brought about the nation. He had this whole idea that, you know, in previous ages, the Catholic Church had been sort of what had motivated people and made them sort of be moral and had helped be an organizing principle for the world. But what he wanted instead was he had this sort of idea that each nation had a historical mission. Like they were destined to do something amazing. France had shown its destiny by conquering all of Europe for a while and being France. And he argued, but Italy, just as Italy was a moral leader back during the Renaissance, you know, as I mentioned Dante or Leonardo da Vinci, they thought that Italy could be this beacon to the world. This sort of this idea that everyone that would inspire people and it would do great things and this would motivate Italians to instead of being divided, sort of behave in concert. This is all beautiful rhetoric. The problem is most Italians could not have even conversed with him, actually, because the vast majority of Italians were not intellectuals who were reading books about Napoleon, were they? Peasants, precisely. Um, but anyway, he's really, he's, I mean, he says this quite bluntly, that basically our manifest destiny, instead of working towards God, should be working towards the Italian nation. So, I mean, this is openly an attempt to create something to replace Catholicism that would unite all Italians. Now that's the problem Italy has more than any other country is that Catholicism is not just a belief system, they live there. And this is a huge problem because on one level, you're like, well, surely you guys could just rally around being Catholic, right? That's something you have in common. Like you don't all speak Italian. You kind of hate each other, but the Pope, huh? The problem is the Pope's went to absolutely nothing to do with this idea of Italy. Briefly, I love calling him Pio Nono, so it is in Italian, it's more fun to say, but Pius IX, Pio Nono, 
briefly plays footsies with the revolutionaries. He like pardons people and says, maybe we can talk a little about Italy. But when 1848 happens, he says, okay, no, no, we're done. No, no. Uh, and basically, you know, as, as unification unfolds, the, the papacy opposes it. Uh, in fact, after, you, well, first of all, Rome has to be stormed by troops. Like that's, like Italy is unified without Rome because the French say, no, no, you can't take Rome. We're protectors of the Pope. They have to invade it with soldiers. And after that, basically, Pius IX takes his ball home and sort of refuses to play with the Italian state ever again and threatens any Italian that even runs for office with excommunication. Whoops. Well, there are other countries like Ireland or Poland, certainly, that built their identity around being Catholic. We're Catholic. Those pig Russians are not. We love the Pope. Italy? No, no. I mean, you have a situation where the papacy is an intractable enemy. He basically spends the rest of his life pouting in a fortress. Like, he's like, I'm a prisoner here of my own making, and I refuse to talk to you. It's a problem. I mentioned 1848, things kind of get out of hand. And you have this other guy, Garibaldi, who was sort of like the Che Guevara slash Rambo of the 19th century. This is a guy who, like, he went to fight in revolutions in South America. Uh, you know, he kept busting in and out of jail. Like, he was in France, he was in Italy, he kept getting arrested. Even after unification, he just won't quit. Like, he keeps trying to take Rome to the point that some government has to shoot him in the leg. Like, can you, for the love of God, quit? Just stop. <laughs> but I mean, he becomes this huge symbol of the, the Italian revolutionary spirit, and he invents this awesome pajama like uniform, the red shirts, which becomes, as well, you'll see, they basically help. I'll tell you in a second. What ultimately shifts the situation is a different Napoleon. I mentioned France is important. A different Napoleon, his nephew this time, who had taken over in France for various reasons, decides like a bigger Piedmont, that was the state in the north, like if I made that bigger, it would really piss off Austria. It would make me look amazing. And it would weaken my enemies. So here, <laughs> I love this picture of him in Cavour. Um, this is the Italian prime minister, or the Piedmontese prime minister here, and here's Napoleon taking him for a walk. Um, so what happens essentially is France goes to war with Austria, beats them up, and is given bits of Italy that then they had to pan to Piedmont. Here you go. Um, but you know they're not allowed to take Rome. No, you don't. You know that's supposed to that's the Pope's territory. You don't need to take Southern Italy. But then Garibaldi goes completely berserk, gets a thousand volunteer dudes, goes rogue. Like Cavour seizes all his arms to stop him from doing this. He gets new arms, he goes down to Sicily, and like by himself with these dudes in pajamas takes over all of Sicily and Naples, which have the biggest army in Italy, like a thousand lunatics in pajamas. <laughs> they just keep attacking and keep, and just, the state collapses. Which creates this really awkward situation where Piedmont goes, oh, oh god, oh god. Like this is not what they had wanted. They wanted nothing to do with Southern Italy because it's, I'm gonna say different. They're like, we can have a kingdom in Northern Italy and Southern Italy, we could just saw off and just push into the ocean. So there's a super awkward meeting where the king and Garibaldi are like, hey, you, what's up? And the reason the king marched here was not to consecrate the Italian nation, but to stop him from taking Rome. It's like the Eastern Kentucky of Italy. It's bad. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I feel like in many ways Italy is the Kentucky of Europe. In a lot of just in terms of, uh, keep your hands off my taxes. Anyway, so, mountain people do. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, this is definitely a trip to Awkward Town. But what I love is then they create this whole myth that the revolution was the combined genius of the king, of Cavour, of Mazzini, and Garibaldi. None of whom would have actually spoken to any other, other than the king and Cavour. Yeah. But they come up with this, you know, this, this idea of Italy, and, you know, they essentially, the regime tries to kind of sort of impose it on Italians. Well, you should speak Italian, even though you don't. Here's a cookie. Like they, they, they built some schools. They built absurd, <laughs> absurd monuments to sort of enshrine the nation. Romans, people in Rome call this the wedding cake. Uh, and they claim that the best view in the whole city is from the top of it, which I agree with. The view up there is amazing, but they say it's because the only place you can't see it in Rome. It's so, they demolished part of the Roman Forum to build this. And inside it are like, you have these giant bronze reliefs of Garibaldi, like crushing Austria, like a wrestler, or Victor Emmanuel just like scooping up Italians and making them believe in him. I mean, it's just completely absurd. It'd be like if, it'd be like if the Lincoln Memorial had like moving dioramas of the founding fathers with swords. I mean, it's just completely over the top. And you go in there and they're like, what are you even doing in here? Like, you're American, do you even care about this? We don't even care about this. And the whole thing is covered 
with hundreds of oil paintings of Italians running up mountains in World War I getting slaughtered. <laughs> yeah. Which was real awkward. And then has these pillars of flame in front for the unredeemed provinces. The bits of Italy they didn't get to have. Because Italy, well, they'd only gotten to be a country because people had helped them, and then they didn't get all the bits. They didn't get Rome, they didn't get Venice. I love this. We're all friends, except now we actually all hate each other. But, poor Italy. But, here you know, they are storming Rome. But I gotta say this, however imperfect this idea was, by the time of World War I, you have a generation of at least middle class Italians that feel like it is totally worth shoving their nation's arm into a sausage machine. Like, they, they enter World War I completely willingly. Like, all the rest of Europe goes, Ugh! they sort of stumble into it through the system of alliances. <laughs> Italy sits there for like six months. Who's got something for me? <laughs> like, asking who's the highest bidder, and just, oh my god, this psycho poet. His name is D'Annunzio, and he, he like basically goes to this one-man crusade through poetry to convince Italians to die in huge numbers, to <laughs> take the unredeemed provinces in the north that no one in Italy had ever really heard of. But and this is where Mussolini makes his career, arguing, you know, we need to get in this war, it'll be amazing! And they do. Poor Italy. <laughs> they, oh my god. I mean, essentially this idea of forging the nation and taking all this territory, they waste three quarters of a million dead to take 18 kilometers that they take in the first two weeks. They spend the next three years standing there, losing hundreds of thousands of men fighting in what looks like the moon. It's like up in the mountains. It's 110 degrees in the summer, 20 below zero in the winter, and they, like, the ground is rock, so they just have like, little pickaxes and just lie on it. Like they can't even dig trenches. Year after year after year, they do this. And I would argue that this war in general, I mean, this war was so incredibly destructive. I love the art from this war. Yeah, this is an, yeah. <laughs> this is an American poster. Destroy this mad brute who's sexually assaulting Europe and has crossed the Atlantic and is about to crush America like King Kong. Love it. Or this hideous one here, war is the answer, with Britain as a wild boar octopus monster with a giant sack of money <laughs> and a Russian bear that's just about to eat Germany. Yeah. And they're all talking like this. I mean, this war was essentially a crusade against evil. I mean, they, you know, they, they work themselves into such a froth in a way that it gets difficult for us to imagine because we get into wars and then forget they're happening. Yeah. And then, of course, this whole ha thing happens. I mean, fascism is blatantly an attempt to finally finish unification and sort of unite Italians. And, and we can talk about him later. He's very pouty here. This is when he becomes in charge. Oh, Italy. Okay. So the Soviets. Now they have some of the same things going on. I mean, they're forged in revolution. They get invaded by France, but ultimately, you know, this is a situation where a small group of guys, intellectuals, basically in turtlenecks, sitting around in coffee shops, arguing about we need to fix Russia. This place really sucks. Um, many of them are living in exile, but they sort of come up with this whole idea of basically communism. Now, you know, they're drawing from sources in the West. I mean, it's very, you know, Marx was actually German, writing about German conditions. But they felt like, well, that doesn't necessarily explain our situation, but, you know, basically we have an historical mission to deliver the proletariat power, you know, this idea of the workers. Even though Russia didn't have very many proletarians, well, Italy didn't have very many nationalists either. This is a common problem. But they have this idea that we'll get rid of the czar, we'll wash capitalism, it'll be amazing, and something magical will happen and we'll build some sort of paradise. They're not exactly clear how this is going to work. Um, but, you know, once they get into power, that is essentially what they try and do. They try and create a paradise on this world as opposed to in the next one. Oh, jeez. So they, you know, basically, you know, they realize that they're dealing with a population that's mostly illiterate, mostly peasants. Uh, and, you know, they're promising, what's that to like about land, peace, and bread? You know, they come up with, you know, this whole ideology to appeal to the peasants. I love this picture here. So this is from the Civil War. I know for those of you who are Protestant, you're like, what the hell am I looking at? But for those of you who are Catholic, what is this image supposed to evoke? Oh, isn't there somebody killing a dragon? Absolutely. Who's the saint who slays the dragon? George. Patron saint of England? St. George. So, but instead of St. George slaying the demon, or slaying the, the, the dragon, you have Trotsky looking like a knight slaying the, the serpent of counter-revolution. I love his little Monopoly top hat here. <laughs> so, 
Oh yeah, believe me, they knew exactly what they were doing. I mean, this was a very blatant attempt to essentially create a religious icon to say, hey peasant, I know you've never read Marx or heard of us, but I know you don't like serpents. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know you don't like evil. So remember how you used to like worship God? You could do that, but instead here have this. Um, and, you know, ultimately they do win the Civil War and they proceed to build this incredibly utopian, kind of insane, I love this here, where the broom of reform sweeping the enemies of revolution off the earth. My favorite thing is that Lenin, I've seen him at the Wax Museum in Amsterdam, he was like this tall. He was like a tiny wee person. Um, the, the Civil War doesn't go super well, let's just leave it at that. But after Lenin dies, I think it's under Stalin that the state really takes on very religious overtones. There's literally a quote where Stalin says, I want you to paint this painting so that Lenin, oh, actually, I just spoke here, so it, that Lenin is Jesus and that I'm St. Peter. <coughs> he literally, well, he'd gone to seminary. He was, like, Stalin had been trained as an Orthodox priest. And he said, I want you to create this image where he's Jesus and I'm St. Peter, which is why he does this insane thing. Speaking of religious icons and saints, and I don't know if any of you ever do a bit of medieval cathedral. I mean, that's, here's the foot of Saint Jeff. I mean, this is, he literally preserves Lenin's body. He gets Lenin's orders. Lenin was like, could you please bury me where I was born? So I have a much better idea. I would have turned you into a wax zombie that everyone will look at for the next, like, 70 years. Which, if that is not an attempt to create some sort of religious icon, I do not know what it is. And then Stalin proceeds to basically become the largest poster in the world. I mean, he just, the whole idea, I mean, there's this great moment where his mother asks him, who well, I can never do to tell the story without her sounding like my grandmother, but she's like, so, you know, Joseph, what do you do for a living? He says, grandma, or mother, remember the czar? I'm like him, but more powerful. To which she says, you would have made a better priest. She's like, you. <laughs> I'm not impressed, but yeah. Oh, I love this. He was man of the year twice, actually. Well, he was, um, yeah. I mean, and the Soviets really tried to create this utopia in which farming would be made, perf made perfect through collectivization, in which they would build this whole new civilization in the Urals. This is Magnetogorsk, which means Magnetic Mountain, which was a gigantic, scaled-up replica of Gary, Indiana, which I know sounds insane to you. I know your face, like, why would you want to copy Gary? Gary back in the 30s and 40s, not Gary now. Now, you know, Gary at that time was the largest steel manufacturing city in the world. Oh, geez. Now, now the thing that, you know, not only does the Soviet state have this ideology, it's got priesthood in the form of the Communist Party, it has a pope in the form of Stalin, it has an Inquisition, and the intolerance that this state showed to any sort of dissent, I think in many ways has much more in common with you know, Spain of the 16th century than what we think is a rational way to deal with the state's enemies, like just arresting them. Um, you know, so they, uh, oh, the Soviet Union. I mean, essentially they created a sort of a theocracy in which the theology was not Christianity, but it was this communist ideology with infallible leaders, this man here. And I think that's why when it becomes clear by the early 70s, that it isn't going to deliver on its promises. You know, there's all these hopes in 68 that could be made humane and those fail, particularly in Czechoslovakia. I think that's why when that belief collapses, this thing totally loses its verve. I mean, it limps on for another 20 years, but it doesn't. Like once this sort of aura of creating paradise and of destiny being right around the corner, once that's over there, they kind of go through the motions and build missiles till they're too drunk to function anymore, and then they disappear. <laughs> They, they were around for 75 years, it was a good run. So, uh, and this is the one I know the most about, what may say the least about, because it makes me want to die inside, even talking about it. But this atrocity, uh, you know, National Socialism, very, its creators, you know, Goebbels and Hitler and Himmler, very clearly saw they were trying to create a non-religious religion for the German people. And spoke explicitly in this, in this language, um, Goebbels and Hitler were both huge admirers of the Jesuits. Like, it didn't like Jesuit ideology. Do you know who the Jesuits are? For non-Catholics, this was a sort of a crusading order that had been created during the Reformation to win parts of Europe back to the one true religion, to Catholicism. And so, you know, they, you know, basically 
create a, all of these things, a whole bunch of symbols. You know, they're extremely good at that. Most of the leaders are actually failed artists. So they spend a lot of time drawing like, you know, it's like Project Runway fascism edition, like designing outfits and boots and flow. Oh, they spend so, no, you think I'm kidding, they spend so, look, the most powerful man put in charge of the war economy is a freaking designer. That's what Albert Speer is. I don't think that, I don't, yeah, he was like, he designed like furniture and like interiors and they're like, you, you should run the largest war economy in the world. And he does. He was. And then when he screwed the pooch, he just lied about it and managed to not get executed. Now, the, the, the Germans did appreciate how people look in uniforms. Let's put it, up, put it that way. Um, you know, they created this idea of Hitler as Messiah. I mean, literally, this sort of deliverer that was going to save the German people. He subscribed to a form of anti-Semitism that essentially said that all of human history, instead of being a war between classes, like the Marxists were arguing, or a war between nations, which is what, say, the French and the Italians were arguing, it was a war between basically rival biological communities. And that the Jewish race was by far the most dangerous of these and lived as a parasite among Germans. And their sole objective was to weaken the Aryan race to sort of pull them down to the mock. But most of them weren't even actually racially Jewish. Oh, it, it, the, the beautiful thing about this is race doesn't actually exist. But neither does the proletariat. I and mean, that's the thing about all of these, ultimately, every single one of these things I'm putting before you are literally just a cluster of ideas. Which is weird to think about, because we think of it as, you know, being sort of, there's, there's bodies, and there's flesh, and there's metal, but ultimately, literally, these are, these are they're all sugar candy mountain. Can I interrupt you for a Yeah, please. That, that atoms exist or electrons exist or ideas also. But these are myths. Like you yeah, sure, of course. They're not founded on, on any reality. They're myths. This is the best kind. <laughs> well, I mean, if they, were, if they were open to refutation through facts, they wouldn't work, now would they? Prove to me the Jews aren't dangerous, empirically. Go. You can't, ha ha! I mean, it's, yeah, it's. <laughs> they're, they're completely myths. Like the idea that there even was a Germany prior to any point before the like, 1750s is complete fabrication. So was the idea of Italy. I assure you, 95% of people living in Italy when unification happened didn't do two shits. Yeah. They're like, oh good, we have new landlords that are just like the old landlords. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> but Nazism was incredibly popular. I think well, that's one of the reasons ultimately it proved much more dangerous even than the French idea or the Italian idea. I mean, they, oh, the Germans get going. I mean, they had a fairly long history of tangling with religion. This, I love this picture of Bismarck and the Pope. Like, so even the previous state had had some issues in terms of persecuting minority religions or persecuting Poles. But oh, just every dysfunctional, horrible thing the West has ever done is put in a mixing bowl and just, I mean, you know, whether it's the whole idea of colonization, the idea of manifest destiny in the East, which was a very much a religious idea, that Germany had this historical mission like America, and that's the analogy they always used, just like America marching West. If you remember the schoolhouse rock elbow room talking about our destiny to make it to the Pacific, we're going to do that, except the other direction and kill everyone in Russia to do it. He sort of mentioned this. I mean, you know, it's, oh, National Socialism. You know, the SS was explicitly created as a priesthood with a whole bunch of rituals. I, the History Channel spends way too much time on this, but I take their point. There's all this weird occult stuff they started getting into to try and sort of create some sort of Nordic replacement for Christianity. Like, they started creating these, like, forest theaters, like the ancient Germans enact Aryan myths. I mean, they literally were in the process of creating what they wanted to replace Christianity with, and then they lose the war. So that's the end of that. I love this image of Hitler as knight, which, that looks very uncomfortable. But here he is as the Messiah. And you know, what they were trying to imbue was not a national consciousness per se, but a racial one. And they argued that instead of the collectivity being the nation, or the collectivity being the revolution or some idea of the world proletariat, but collectivity was the German people, the folk. I'll leave the Nazis alone. I, I can talk about this all day, but trust me, Nazism very consciously modeled itself on and tried to replace other faith systems. And had they won that war? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, they were very clear that the reckoning was Christianity was coming after the war. <laughs> oh, America. Now, obviously, you know, America's situation is rather different than Italy's or France's or the Soviet Union's or Germany's, but we have many myths. I love this image here. 
this stuff, yeah. I mean, we, we see this, we're like, yeah, America! I love showing this to, like, Germans. They just sort of shrink when they say, just, the, like, our whole, just the whole thing we do. I mean, you know, America, we're one of the last countries that feels like we can still view the nation as an unquestioned good. And I'm not going to say whether how I feel about that per se, but that doesn't fly in Europe. You have tenure yet? You're damn right I do. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, what I'm going to say, the, the point is this, we, we, World War II was very, the World Wars were a moment of glory for us, where we came in at the last possible second and kicked the door in, shot the Germans and said, we did it, y'all! I mean, stuck a flag in their dead body. Now, the first time we go home after doing that, the second time we're like, okay, we're not leaving this time because last time you got up again. And we don't trust you, Russia. But I mean, the, our view of World War II is this heroic thing where we came in last, we came in hard, and we saved the day! And that's not the experience Europeans had with those wars. Those wars were horrendous. Like, nobody, even the winners came out of World War II completely bankrupt. I mean, the British and the French just, like, they limp on for a few more minutes, but their empires crumble to pieces. And so, whether it's this idea of the nation or the idea that we're a city on the hill, just the way we talk, like, to us this seems normal, but when I, I love watching American speeches with Europeans, they're like, why do you talk like this? You know, we're a beacon of freedom to all mankind. Inside every one of these fill in the blank, Iraqi, Vietnamese, whatever, is an American struggling to get out because everyone wants to be like us. How can you prove this? I can't. Here's Coke. I mean, we just, you know. We, you know I'm right. We are incredibly convinced of our own amazingness. And we should agree that, like, Americans don't even feel we need to know, we need to know where other countries are. You know I'm right. They just horrible, like, find France on a map. And they're like, the Pacific. I mean, they don't. I, and just, you know, I think it's not just the national idea that we have a lot of myths about. I think we have a lot of ideas about the free market that are based on no facts whatsoever, unfortunately. And I can prove this to you by the idiot economics that led to the meltdown of 2008, which none of them saw coming. The most highly paid economists in the world, all these business people, this idea that, you know, you can just generate money forever and it's magic and it'll flow and you put a hat on it and, oh my God, it's on fire. <laughs> I mean, and nearly every single assumption that created that bubble proved to be false. But we just can't. I mean, I think Americans questioned this much, like, I mean, you don't even know what it was like in the 90s. You, like, questioning this, people were like, you're crazy, history's over, the Soviet Union is gone. Money will just flow out of our mouths like vomit forever. <laughs> You just couldn't even question this. But again, I'm not saying that the market doesn't have its uses, and I'm not saying there isn't some truth to classical economics, but this idea that it's, there's some sort of invisible hand, and it never involves the state, it's, it's all, these are literally myths, they're not actually facts. And, you know, we live in a society that, I, I bet you if I put most of you on the spot and ask you to define what capitalism was, you couldn't, which scares the shit out of me. Like this is, you know, this country more than any other country in the world holds us forward as, you know, we're the preeminent democracy, we're the preeminent capitalist power. What's capitalism? Not socialism. And I think money is involved and something about competition and hating Obama. That's all I got. <laughs> He's a socialist, obviously. When I put in national socialist, half the pictures that came up with Obama and SS here. You know, like, I, I hate the internet so much. Dude, if anyone's got a computer, if you don't believe me, do it right now. Obama is like, Obama. Is. Yes. <laughs> Which you can, I, there's a lot to be said about Obama. I think his presidency will go down as meh in history, but uh, something's gonna gone better, but the, just, no, no. But I mean, just we, you know, I mean, this is one of our great strengths. We made it to the freaking moon. I mean, you know, we're a society that really believes in itself and how amazing it is. And sometimes that we do heroic things like the great society, or when we finally came to terms with slavery, but Sometimes it gives us this sort of sense of unreality that makes us impossible to talk to if you're like a normal country that, you know, lost some wars and won some and believes in things like the welfare state or health care or not shooting each other or... Anyway, the point is, um, you know, we live in an era now where the American myths, I think, are the most important just given our position in the world and I don't think we spend a lot of time thinking about this, honestly. Like what the American nation is, what the market is. I mean, all of these, again, they're, they're, they're myths and they're ideas, but I mean, they're basically taught as gospel. And I don't think this is unique. I think every country does this, but not every country has, you know, bases in 60 countries and is at war in like 12. And, <laughs> you know, can have a real estate bubble that destroys the global economy, which is a pretty amazing trick. And then the bailout. 
<laughs> sucked another half of all the capital in the world out. So even when we were fixing ourselves, we're fixing it. We're like drowning everyone in the pool. <laughs> I mean, just we're a country that our behavior has huge consequences for better or for worse. And right now we're kind of pouting and not playing nice. But again, I challenge you to go to any other country and say, just talk to them about their notion of what America is and what its place in the world is. And you'll feel like you're talking about a different planet. It just doesn't even, that conversation is difficult to start. Manifest destiny. Let's go back to this amazing picture. It's a birthday. Um, it's birthday. <laughs> oh, America. So, that was a whirlwind tour through five nations and five seemingly really good, but not always so great ideas that, you know, some of them have run their course. You know, communism is sort of an adjustment of history. National socialism, other than a few jackasses that win like 10% in European elections, that's pretty much done or gangs in Breaking Bad, so they're trace Nazis. But, you know, the American thing is going strong, the French thing is going strong, and I don't know about Italy. They just had their 150th birthday, and it was a trip to Awkward Town. Like, they live in a situation now where half the country which is the other half that sink to the ocean. Like, there's an entire political party, basically the Die Southern Italy Die Party, which, well, we are kind of African, would be their argument. Saudi Calabria, that's one of my favorite things they use. Yeah. So, let's talk about any of these. America, National Socialism, Belgian Nationalism, whatever. Can we not, can we, I want to mention, what about North Korea? Like oh, jeez. Right? North Korea has created a red monarchy. Right. I mean, that's Bruce Cummings' argument, is that essentially they've recreated the Confucian dynastic argument. But, I mean, they're like on the third generation of that insanity. And my favorite, Kim Jong-il, who is not only North Korea's leader, but its greatest general, its greatest poet, its greatest ballerina, its great just... I mean, holy crap! But that's what happens when you are allowed to create a belief system in almost complete isolation, with no checks on your authority. Like, there's no countervailing narratives. There's no... I mean, they're just living in fantasy land. My, my wife and I watched this amazing documentary about synchronized gymnastics, and, like, the power would go off, and they'd be like, STUPID AMERICA! And you're like, what? <laughs> like, literally, like, anything, like, you know, they stub their toe, or their car won't start, CURSE YOU, YANKEE IMPERIALIST! <laughs> what? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what they've learned. I mean, not entirely that reason, our running with Korea was, um, double plus ungood. Let me just leave it at that. I mean, we did kind of destroy every city on the entire Korean peninsula two or three times to the point that we ran out of things worth bombing. That's what we do. Sorry. I mean, we helped the southern half rebuild, the northern half not so much. But I mean, no, it's, oh, dude, Cambodia. With the Khmer Rouge, who, oh dang. I mean, that's the thing, this communist idea, even if the Soviet Union was the original one, China, Cambodia, China. We're gonna make magic, you know, we're just gonna bang pots and pans and chase all the birds away and produce enough food to just overflow with gray and oh god, 30 million of us are starved. <laughs> Which then they had to deny for the next, like, 50, it's, it's, I can tell you a very similar story about societies in Asia. This isn't unique to Europe, I just know the European case is best. But believe me, this is a human trait, unfortunately.